Hello Grade 10s, it's John here. Today we're doing a really exciting topic. The topic is matter. Now you might say, well, what is matter all about? Well, we're going to show you and you'll be in for a surprise because there are so many things that we've got to discuss and let's have a look at those key details of where our focus is for this session. So here we go, we're dealing with matter today and we're going to say, what is matter? Well, maybe you can, you can answer that. What is matter? Well, let's see if you're right. Uh, properties of matter. What are some of the properties? And how can we classify matter, the classification of matter? We're going to look at different forms that matter takes in the form of a mixture. There are different types of mixtures. Then we're going to look at pure substances, which include elements and compounds. We'll have quite a lot to say about those. And then we'll notice that all of these uh, examples of matter come in different states. So we'll talk about the states of matter as well. Right, now, uh, that's a, an overview for what we're going to be looking at. But let's start with being really concrete. So what is the stuff that we call matter? Um, well, you might have an idea. I think that what we need to do is just have a look at a couple of examples. Well, to start off, we've got some stuff here, some yellow stuff in the plastic bag. Let's have a closer look at it. I get it out in my fingers, and you can have a, a really close look at it. Um, you'll see it's all powdery stuff. It all looks the same. I can crumble it, and it, it, it forms a yellow powder. Um, then there's this, which is quite familiar. I'm sure you've seen that around, polystyrene ball, and then we've got a candle. Now, uh, these are all different. They all are different uh, examples of matter. Here's some, some foil that you would find at home, and, and here's some stuff that is also a thin sheet, and it's got a, a gray color to it, and it's a kind of a metallic look to it. And here's another uh, bit of metal. You might have seen something like this hanging around. Um, it's quite Quite interesting because uh, this is a, a brass ball here and um, it's, it's used to show uh, a heating experiment which we haven't got time to do today but we might get time a little later and then th there's something interesting here this stuff here has got an interesting property in that if I bring something like that together it sticks take it apart it doesn't um, uh, it pulls together so all of these are different forms of matter and, uh, well, what's the general thing that they all have in common? Well, I'd like to suggest to you two big things. That all matter has mass, and all examples of matter have volume. So they occupy space. They take up space. When we say they occupy volume, they take up space. And it's, we're going to come back to these two definitions in terms particularly of the volume when we look at the different phases or states of matter a little later. And you've seen that there's a variety of examples of stuff all around you that we would say, yes, this is matter. Uh, there are very few things that we can touch and feel and, and get a hold on and look at that aren't matter. But there are a couple of things that, for example, the sound that you're hearing, it's not matter. Uh, visual things that you see, like a flame or a light burning, uh, the light radiating, that's a form of energy. It's not matter. So there's a difference between matter and energy. And we need to understand that there is that difference. But we're going to focus not on energy today. We're going to focus on matter. So let's move on and let's say, well, what are some of the properties of matter? And all of the examples I've shown you have different properties. Well, one of the things is some some of the uh, things that I've shown you, they are strong. Of course, others are weak. So like that yellow powder, um, it's quite crumbly. It's quite weak. It's not very strong. Um, then you get some things that are called thermal conductors. We'll have more to say about that. But thermal, thermal relates to heat and what happens when you heat something. Uh, is it going to conduct the heat or is it going to insulate? We'll talk about that a little later. Then the next that I have on the list is electrical conductors, things that conduct electricity and things that don't. 
And then we have things that are brittle. They break easily. Things that are malleable. Now, when we talk about malleable, we talk about something that can be rolled into a sheet. It can be bent and, and take a particular form. So we'd say this metal is malleable. And then the second word that is important is ductile. Ductile means that it can be drawn into a piece of wire. So if we take a closer look, I mean, you're very familiar with wire. It's thin, it can be bent. Not all substances can be made into into wire but this metal this copper metal is very good as a uh, an example of something that is ductile and then we have something that is magnetic there are a whole bunch of substances that are magnetic I showed you an example of one uh, there are properties that are uh, substances that are magnets and there's those that have magnetic properties they're affected by a magnetic field then we can say different substances have different densities that is, they have a different relationship between their mass and volume. So remember we said all matter has mass and volume, so that means that all matter will have different density. Pure substances have a very specific density, and that's how we can tell they're actually pure, by looking at their density. Another very important thing that we will look at is the boiling point and melting point, particularly of pure substances. These are the points or the temperatures at which substances change phase. They change phase from a liquid to a gas, then that's boiling point, or from a solid to a liquid, that's its the temperature at that point is called the melting point. Now all of these are the properties of materials uh, and, and of matter in particular. Uh, materials and matter, materials are just a form of matter that's put together for a purpose. So it's a very important word that you will see and hear. We're focusing on matter today. We're going to look now at how we can classify matter, having looked at some of the properties of matter, and we'll have a little longer look at matter in more detail. Right, now here's a, a sketch of being able to classify matter. The first thing to say is that we can get pure substances and we can get mixtures. I want to cl uh, clarify for you what's the difference between a mixture and a pure substance. Well, here's my idea. If I had to take this candle and I had to slice through it, other than the wick just the candle bit. Um, what I would notice is that everywhere in the candle, in the wax part, it's the same. It's the same stuff. Uh, there wouldn't be a huge variation between one part of the candle and the other. It's of similar stuff. That we would say it's pure. It doesn't have impurities. Because it's got the wick, it is actually impure. It's kind of a mixture because it's got a, a nylon wick or a cotton wick and it's got a wax. So in this sense, the candle is an example of a mixture. If we took the polystyrene, we cut it in half. This is pure. All the way through, you would find polystyrene, polystyrene, polystyrene. Okay, so there's nothing much different there. But if we had to take a look at this uh, lump over here, there are some air particles in between it. It was once sugar, but I've dehydrated it, and I'm left with a lump of carbon. And there is some other, there are other impurities, some burnt sulfur and all sorts of stuff inside there that I don't want to get into. It's kind of a mixture. So the difference between mixtures and pure substance, very important that you note this. When it's the same type of stuff all the way through, then we're saying it's pure. If it's different stuff, so if we think about it, some of it might be green and some of it might be red and some of it, then we've got a mixture. So let's have a look at different mixtures now. We're going to focus on mixtures. Well, what is a mixture? A mixture is a combination of two or more substances, okay, where these substances are not bonded, they're not joined to each other, and no chemical reaction, very important, occurs between the substances. The properties, so that's the definition, and it's something that you need to know. It's a combination of things. They've just been lumped together, but there's no joining taking place. 
What are the properties? They're not in any fixed ratio. That means that you could have a drop of one stuff, uh, one substance, and 10 million liters of the other substance as a mixture. On the other hand, you could have a different mixture. We have two liters and two liters combined to make four liters. Well, those are all mixtures. There's no fixed ratio of the components. They don't have to go in any order. What's the next thing? Notice they keep their physical properties. So what we're saying here is that uh, if we've got salt and um, iron filings mixed together, or flour and, and uh, sand mixed together, the sand still stays sand and the salt still stays salt. This is the important thing. They can be separated by mechanical means. And there are a whole lot of different methods for separating mixtures, by filtering, by hand sorting, by using a magnet. So there are a whole lot of ways of separating mixtures, and none of them involve a chemical reaction. You can evaporate stuff off, you can dry stuff out, and you will be able to separate a whole lot of different mixtures. Different techniques for different types of mixtures, agreed, but they're all mechanical. They don't involve forming new substances, and that's very important. So, let's have a look at some examples. I've shown you some examples, but we can give some names to them, and these are given in your textbook, in the Everything Science textbook. A liquid, a liquid, where, so they, they're immiscible. Immiscible. We call that an emulsion. So it's an example is oil and water. When we get a solid and liquid, so like uh, mud and water, we call it a suspension. We can have gas and liquid. So this is where you have carbon dioxide in a fizzy drink. Well, that's called an aerosol. And smoke is an example of a gas and solid, where we have um, the name of the mixture is called smoke, but it's actually referred to as smog. Um, what about some uh, examples of different, these are examples of heterogeneous mixtures. So what about some of the homogeneous ones? Take a look here. We've said and we've illustrated that a homogeneous mixture is one that is uniform, where the different components can't be seen. Have a look at this example of, of a mixture. I'm just going to pull it forward. Here I have a beaker of water, and here I have some colored water. Um, they're both of the same consistency, and if I pour the one into the other, you'll notice that they mix. There is no difference between them. They've, they've formed they're a homogeneous solution. There's no separation here. If I take a bit of water, another beaker of water, and I take some solid uh, stuff here, which is actually a salt, and I add the salt to the water, at the moment I've got a solid inside the solution. But if I stir it, what you'll notice is that the solid dissolves until all the particles that were solid have changed and you can't see any more particles. Right, now that we've looked at the properties of mixtures and we've been able to separate them, distinguish between them, let's have a look at pure substances. Go back to our classification diagram, look something like that. We've got mixtures on the one side, the heterogeneous and the homogeneous. Now we're going to say, what about pure substance? Recognizing that these ones aren't pure substances, what categories can we get here? Well, the first category, which is very important, is that we can get compounds. Now, compounds, we'll have more to say about in a little while, but the one that I want to deal with as well is elements. So there are two forms, elements and compounds. Elements are your basic building blocks. If we have a little bit more of an insight into elements, let's get the picture of what elements are all about. Uh, if we break them apart into subcategories, well, over here you will get something called a non-metal, and over here you get something called a metal. Now the metals themselves can be broken up and divided into two further groups. So let's have a look at those and then you'll see the whole picture. You get those that are magnetic and you get those that are 
non-magnetic. And there's the classification as a big picture. Let's have an individual look at each of these components now. We'll start off with the elements and have a careful look at what makes up the elements and what they really consist of. So what is an element? An element is a substance that cannot be broken down into simple other sample substances through chemical means. So this isn't a mixture. We're taking a substance, we're saying, let's try and get it as simple as possible. Purify it, break it apart, pull it apart, try and get the simplest form of it. We can't get it simpler than that. So elements become the basic building blocks for all of matter. They're the simplest substances that exist. And in fact, chemists over the years have started to, to classify them and put them into groups, as I've mentioned. They classify them. There's the periodic table, which we'll learn more about. It's the periodic table of the elements. There are 92 or so uh, naturally occurring elements. And more recently, we've been able to manufacture some elements of our own. We'll have more to say about that later. What else can we say about elements? Well, let's rather say something about compounds. Compounds, difference between elements and compounds is that if we take an element and we join it together, combined elements, in a fixed ratio, then we will get a substance that we call a compound. So I hope you've got that. Elements are the simple building blocks. When we join them together, well, then they form compounds. Very easy, but we need to get our vocabulary right. We need to make sure that we understand the difference between these substances. They're both pure substances and they're both combined. The interesting thing here when we make compounds is that a compound doesn't have the properties of the elements from which it comes. So for example, if we take this as a simple example and we say we know that here is an example of a compound. Uh, if we take some sodium, which is a metal. We know that that's a metal. And we take something like chlorine, which is a non-metal and it's a gas. It's a non-metal. We'll explain why it's a metal and a non-metal just now. Um, we put those together. We can make a compound called sodium chloride. Now, this is something that's quite common. It's known as table salt. Now, this metal, sodium, is a gray metal. It reacts with water. It's quite explosive. It forms a, a, a very dangerous stuff called caustic soda, which can even eat away bones. Chlorine is used as a poison. It was used in the First World War as a gas to poison people. Uh, it's a, a very horrible, dangerous gas. Put them together, and you get stuff that you can eat. In fact, that we can't do without. So, I hope you can see. It forms a new substance, totally different properties, and it's combined in a particular way, in a fixed ratio. One sodium for every chlorine atom. And we've put them together uh, in that way. Now, I've mentioned a word there, atom, but we'll have more to say about that in a later session. So they're formed in a very special way. Now, let's have a look at some questions. Our first example is for us to be able to distinguish between different substances. Look at the table below. Uh, in the first column, A, is a list of substances. In the second is a description of the group of these substances, uh, th that these substances belongs to. Match up the substance in column A with the description in B. So here we go. Uh, the first thing that we're going to say is we've got, in column A, we've got the word iron. Now, what is it? If we look at it, um, we would be able to recognize that iron is an element. So it's on the periodic table. It's a simple substance. You can't make it any simpler. It is an element. Now, what about this strange thing here? Now, chemists are, are really strange because they go from 
three ways of referring to things. They look at the big picture, like looking at this stuff. They can represent what's happening at a tiny level by drawing diagrams. We call that the sub-microscopic view. And then they can do a symbol, and they can write a symbol. You're going to need to learn to write and to name these symbols. So let's have a look and break down what the symbol really means. Well, hopefully you can see this has got an H and it says there are two of them and an S. Now H stands for the element hydrogen. So H stands for hydrogen. And S stands for sulfur. So the combination of hydrogen and sulfur is known as hydrogen sulfide. Now, this is not an element. It's a compound comp containing two elements. We can see the hydrogen and the sulfide. So we're going to say for uh, iron, the answer is D. For H2S, the answer is A. Well, now, what about a sugar solution? Now, can we see a difference when we mix sugar and water? If the sugar is all dissolved. Can we see a difference? No. Then it must be a homogeneous mixture. It's homogeneous. Uh, it was originally two different states, solid and, and, uh, and liquid, but it's dissolved. We can see a difference in them. Uh, we can't see a difference. Right. What about the next one? So we're going to say that one's E. Sand and stones. Well, we can see a difference between the sand and the stones. The sand is little particles. The stones are big particles. You can see where the one ends and the one big, it begins. So that's a heterogeneous mixture. It's number B. And that means that we're left with steel. Now, what is steel? Steel is a combination of different metals. It's mainly iron, but there is all sorts of other additives put into steel to strengthen it and to do various things. We call steel an alloy. So a metal alloy is what steel is. It's an example of that. Th here I had an example of brass. And if I just show it over there, get a nice close-up of it, you'll see that it looks like it's pure substances. But in fact, this is made up of two metals. It's made up of copper and tin. And it gives it its special properties which give this the name of brass. So when you're looking at brass screws or you're looking at brass ornaments around the house, you'll be able to recognize that this is an alloy. It's an example of a mixture, a metal mixture, uh, called an alloy. Okay. Right, now that we've looked at that example, let's go to a break. And after the break, I'll come back and we'll have a look at how we name compounds. So get ready for that. We'll be back with you in a few minutes. Great tens, welcome back. We're back to have a look at focusing on compounds. Now, one of the skills that you're going to need to do is not only to be able to recognize what a compound is, that it's a combination of elements, but you're going to need to write both the names and the chemical symbols. Now, this is not that difficult, but you do need to do some learning. And the important thing here, the thing that's going to make it easy for you, is if you learn some basic rules. Metals are elements that are on the periodic table that uh, usually are on the left-hand side, and the non-metals are on the right-hand side. They have different physical properties. But when we write the names, we usually write the name of the metal first, and then the non-metal. There are lists that you can put together uh, and, and start to learn them as well. We say that usually when bonding takes place to form a compound, it's a process where the metal becomes positively charged because it does some strange things, and the non-metal in the process becomes negatively charged. The positives and the negatives attract each other. So what we've got here is when we look at, at the structure of our pure substances, we recognize that we've got these two groups. Metals tend to form positively charged ions, positively charged ions, known as cations, and the non-metals form negatively charged anions. 
and when those join together they form compounds. So here is a list or a table that is quite useful for us to know. Uh, you will see here a list of all the um, uh, many of the ions that are positively charged and so we've got hydrogen, potassium, copper and you'll see that they have positive charges different positive charges which we can then use to write the names now what about the others are there some negative ones yes there are and there are the list of negative ones so some of these are all on their own they are simple uh, non-metals joined together and you'll see so fluori fluoride chloride bromide and iodide even oxide there, uh, there's not much of a combination. But there you'll notice that in these ones, there's more than one. So there's a combination of things. We call these, um, they're more complex. They are known as polyatomic ions. M poly meaning many atoms to form one iron. So for example here, hydrogen sulfate, it's got a hydrogen, one hydrogen, one sulfur and four oxygens. So you can see it's quite a complex idea but it's quite simple to recognize that hydrogen sulfate is minus one and it can fit with something that is plus one to form a compound. Let's have a look at some examples to see how we can use this table to write some names down and to write down some formula as well. So here are some examples. Our second example, KBR. First of all we need to recognize we're going to ask for the name. Now what I want you to see is the K, there's one K there, there's one BR. We're going to name it according to that table list. K go and look on the list, we want to look at the metal list and we see there Potassium is K, and if we go to the next page and we go and look at Br, you'll see Br minus is bromide. So it doesn't take much to see that we're going to name this as potassium bromide. Hope you've got that. It's important that you pay careful attention and that you use your table to put things together. Now why it does that and why the one is plus one and the other is minus one, I don't want you to fuss about at the moment. Later when we've done some theory of bonding, you will understand it a little bit de in more detail. At the moment we just want to get the simple idea, if we can put potassium and bromide together, we write the symbol as KBR. The name for KBR is potassium bromide. Very important. One of the things that I want you to, to see over here, the element is called bromine, but when it combines, it's like getting married. It changes its name. It becomes IDE. So I remember that when you, mar when you get married, the girl is the bride, IDE, so the name changes to IDE. Let's try the next one, see how that forms. Well, can you identify the elements? Well, there's hydrogen, and CL stands for chlorine. So, what do you think it's going to be? Hydrogen and chlorine, remember, when they get married, the name changes. It's no longer chlorine, but it's going to be chloride. So, we're going to write hydrogen chloride because they've joined together. Now, just to make sure that we've got this right, let's go and have a look at that table of cations and anions again. And the cations over here, you'll see hydrogen is plus one, and the chloride was minus one, plus one, minus one, they have the same charge, they cancel each other out, so they will join to form one new substance, HCl hydrogen chloride. Now, here's the next one. K MnO4. Now, what I want you to notice here is that under the MnO4, if we look at this list, we've got permanganate, MnO4. So we've got K from previously was potassium, and MnO4 is from here permanganate. Put them together, what do you get? Potassium 
permanganate. Let's write it down. Potassium permanganate. Next one. NO2. What elements do you recognize there? N stands for nitrogen. O for oxygen. That's right. So what we would say here, this is nitrogen. Now, if we've got two, a special rule that we've got when we've got two oxygens is we must say how many oxygens we've got. So instead of just saying nitrogen oxygen or nitrogen oxide, which we could do, there is another naming system we can use. We look at the number of oxi oxygens and we see that there's a two there. So instead of just saying nitrogen oxide, we say nitrogen dioxide. The di indicates that there are two oxygens, nitrogen dioxide. The alternative name for this substance um, will be a little, is a little bit more complex. There is another name, which I'm not going to go into right now. We'll leave it for later. Let's go to the next one. Have a look here. We've got NH4 and OH. Complex ions here. Uh, polyatomic ions. Two of them joined together. If we go to our list of cations and anions. Uh, we'll have to look, first of all, for NH, NH4+. Plus, and there it is. NH4+, plus ammonium. Please don't forget that. It's one that is asked very often. So you need to learn it. Ammonium. And this one is hydroxide. Put the names together and you get ammonium hydroxide. Ammonium hydroxide. Okay. Well, what about the next one? Here we've got a slightly different story. Uh, we've got Na, which we can recognize as sodium, and SO4. SO4, if you look on the table of the, of the anions, SO4 is sulfate. So what we've got here is sodium sulfate. Write it down. Sodium sulfate. Now, please notice, it's not sodium sulfate. Uh, the way I remember this is four um, uh, oxygens is the highest number, and four times two is eight. The charge on the sulfate is minus two. So four times two is eight, and that's why it's the ATE. ATE has the bigger number of oxygens. Sulfite is SO3 with the smaller number of oxygens. So what else can we learn from this, this particular formula or this particular example? It tells us that we want two sodiums. Notice, there are the two sodiums. We want two sodiums for every one sulfate. Although we just write the name as sodium sulfate, it's telling us that there's an imbalance. Sodium from our table, back here, uh, if we go to the table, you'll notice that sodium is uh, on the table, if we can find it, uh, there it is, plus one, sodium plus one, whereas sulfate on this table is minus two, the two minus at the top there. So they're not balancing directly. 1 is plus 1, 1 is minus 2. So how are we going to get them equal? Well, we need two of these to match the two of those, the minus 2. So two plus 1s for every 1 minus 2. I hope that's clear for you. So that's why we write it like that. It's important that you look at the formula, look at the name, because you need to do both processes. This one tells us that we've got iron and we've got nitrate. Iron and nitrate. Now, it helps us that we recognize that nitrate, there are three of them. And iron, there's only one of them. What does this mean? Well, let's see how the charges balance up. I'm going to go to the nitrate list first. And let's have a look. 
nitrate, nitride, and let's see, there we are, nitrate. NO3, it's minus 1. Now, what about the iron? Go and look at the cation, iron, and here's a very interesting thing that we'll begin to see, that there are different forms of iron. There's a plus 3, and there should be another one that is iron plus 2. In this case, we've got three nitrates, three times minus 1 and only one iron. So that means that it must be the iron 3. It's carrying a charge of 3 plus. So because of that, we take the name with the Roman numerals in it. So let's do that, and we'll go straight to the answer. We're going to say it's not just any old iron, it's iron 3 nitrate. How did we get the 3? Because that's minus 1, and this one is plus 3. And you can look at that on the table. Now, what about the next one? This is sulfite. This PB you should recognize as belonging to the group the, or the element lead. So we've got lead, sulfite. Remember, it's not four. It's three oxygens there. So sulfite. But what's the middle number? Well, let's have a look at the table, and let's see what the sulfite charge is. Sulfite, see what it is, and then from there we'll be able to work out what we need to match. So if we go here, uh, and we change our color, sulfite minus 2, up there. So that means that we're looking for, because we've got one sulfite and one lead, let's find the lead. Uh, we're looking for uh, lead, and you'll see you've got lead 2 plus. There is another lead. I don't know if it's on this table. It doesn't look like it is. I can't see it on this table. But lead does come in another form that is plus 4. So you've got to be very careful that you tell people which lead you're dealing with. So that's why we're going to write the name correctly, um, and we're going to write it in full. We're going to write it over here as lead 2 sulfate, sulfite at least. Oh, getting our tongues twisted. Now, what about the next one? Almost the last one. In fact, it is the last one. We've got Cu, which stands for copper. And now we've got this HCO3. HCO3, what could that be? Let's have a look on the table um, and make sure that we've got it because there are different names for this. HCO3, look over here. Here's the name for it, HCO3 minus hydrogen carbonate, carbonate. So we're going to fill that in. Notice it's minus 1, and the copper is plus 2. So we know that this is minus 1, and there are two of them, so this is copper plus 2. I'm going to predict that this is plus 2, and I'm going to put a plus 2 over there in my name. So I'm going to say copper 2, hydrogen carbonate. Let's check it, go back to our table and make sure that we've got the right thing for copper. There we go, copper can be one. In this case we know it's not one because then we wouldn't need two of them and we've got copper two over here. So we've chosen the right one because copper two matches with two hydrogen uh, carbonates. So there we go. We've got the answer. Now, we've done it the one way. We've taken the formula and written the name. It takes a little bit of practice getting used to. You need to have the tables out in front of you. But I hope you can see that compounds are a combination of different elements. And they're combined in fixed ratios so that the final product is electrically neutral. Um, there are rules that we will go through. The next statement, though, the next exercise, is to do the opposite. The other process that we want to do is to take the name and see if we can write the formula. Well, it shouldn't prove too difficult. Let's see how we manage. And uh, I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker so that we can make sure that we get everything in. So, potassium, K. Nitrate, we've seen before, it's NO3. 
All we've got to check on the table, check for yourself now, potassium is plus one, nitrate is minus one. So they join together, they're fine. There's no problem. Let's go to the next one. Na for sodium, oxide is O2 minus. Just check that out. There we go. Oxide, O2 minus. And we know that sodium, which we saw earlier, was plus one. So how many plus ones are we going to need to match the minus two? Well, that's right, we're going to need two of them. So let's write it down. Here goes our formula, and we're going to put it into um, our formula here. This was plus one, that was minus two, so we're going to say two of those. Now here's an interesting thing, uh, just some working that you can do just to help you. If you write down the charge of the sodium, and you write down the charge of the oxide, and then you do the following. In your head or on a piece of paper, you just cross over. You do the cross your heart method um, and drop the sign. Then you can see that you're going to get a 2 that will fit in over there and a 1 that will fit in over there. For every 2 of these, we'll need one of those. It's a fixed ratio. It's the difference between a compound and a mixture. A compound, there's the same ratio of little pieces of substances that have joined together. Right, go to the next one. Barium sulfate. Now, barium sulfate, SO4. Now, this is plus 2, and that's minus 2, so I'm going to leave it there. Go to the next one, aluminium chloride. Here, this one is plus 3. So let's do the working on the side. We'll say plus 3. Chloride, we've seen already, is minus 1. So how are we going to match those? Well, if we cross over, do the crossover story, then the 3 will go down there and the 1 will go there. So that means that my correct answer will be AlCl3. What about magnesium phosphate? Well, magnesium phosphate, PO4. Let's just check the signs. I uh, want to go back and just check that you've got it. See if you can find them. Magnesium plus 2. Got it? Magnesium plus 2. What about phosphate? Where is phosphate? There we are. There we've got it. Minus 3. So this is an unusual one. One we haven't seen before. Uh, let's see if we can work it out. I hope you can see that with our little rule, it's not going to be, prove too difficult. So if we write magnesium, we put a 2 plus over there. Phosphate, we do the minus 3 up top there. We're going to cross over. We're going to cross over. The 3 will come down there. The 2 will go there. But now here's the problem. If I put a 3 over here, it's going to get, look like 43. So I must be very careful. I can't just put the three down. I must put the polyatomic iron in a bracket. Very important. So you've seen it before. I want to just mention it here, show you why we do it. We want to say we need three of these, uh, two of these things. We need three of these things because three times two will give me six and two times three is going to give me six minus. Plus 6, minus 6, they've joined together, and they're going to be very happy. Right, what about tin bromide? Well, it tells us what the charge is. It's tin 2, so Sn, and we know it's a charge of 2. Bromide, we know, is 1, so that's going to be SnBr2. Now, come to the last one. Manganese, Mn, capital M, small n, phosphide, P. Now, we know that this is 2. What about phosphide? Let's check it out. Go back to our table. It's from your textbook, so you can always check it until you've learned them. And we're looking for phosphide, and it's P minus 3. So it's minus 3, and we're going to uh, look now to put that together. So there we go, and it's the last one on this page. So we've got a minus 3 here and we've got a plus 2. How's it going to work? Cross them over and see if you can get it sorted. 
So the 2 will go down there, the 3 will go there, and that means that I'm going to get this good-looking formula, MN 3 P 2. Excellent. I hope you've got those. Now, please remember that the secret to writing these formula is practice, practice, practice. Do as many as you can. Once you've written down the answer, cover them up, cover up the question and see if you can do it the other way around. It's a really good method of, of preparing. So, add some extras to this and make sure that we've got it right. Now, having written down the formula of compounds, I, I would like to just move back from the symbolic representation that we've been looking at and say, well, what are some of the properties of metals, non-metals, and, and even the ones in between the metals and the non-metals, which we call semi-metals or metalloids? So let's have a more detailed look at the properties of these substances. We're just going to pick up some important properties very briefly, uh, but I think before we do that, let's go do a short break, and we'll be back with you straight after that. Right, welcome back. Now that we've got the idea of what elements are, what compounds are, and how to name compounds, let's get a closer idea of what some of the physical properties are of elements. Remember, elements can be broken up into metals and non-metals, and there are, even within those categories, a, a breakdown of metals that are magnetic and non-magnetic. We're going to look at some of those macroscopic properties now. So what do you know about metals? What are they good for? What do they do really well? Well, metals are very good conductors of heat. Where you can tell this? Look at your oven. Look at your stove. They are made up of metal substances that conduct heat. Even a, a heater uh, has a, an electrical conduction that glows bright and it spreads along. As you start heating up one end, it gets very hot. You'd know this. If you leave a spoon in very hot water, you touch it, it will get really hot, even though that the end of the spoon is not in the water. So we can say metals are good conductors. They're very good conductors of both electricity and heat. Uh, you'll have seen earlier that metals usually are shiny. They're malleable and ductile. Now, metals have different melting points. Some metals have a low melting point. That means they, they, at a low temperature, they will change from being a solid to a liquid. For example, mercury at room temperature is a liquid. Very, very cold mercury will turn to a solid. But at room temperature, it's a liquid. If we heat it up, it becomes a gas. We'll talk about those changes in state a little while later. Now, melting points of metals are, there's a range. Some have very high, and as I've indicated, mercury is one that is very low. Density also varies. You can get something that is really dense, like lead or even gold, and then aluminium, which is one of the least dense metals. So density depends on how the particles inside the metal are packed. And then the final thing that I wanted to just mention to you is that metals have different metallic properties. Not all metals are, met uh, are magnetic. But what about the non-metals? As we've listed those, We'd have to say for the non-metals, they're not good conductors. They're not good conductors. They are generally, they generally have a low melting points. Because many non-metals are actually gases. They have low melting points. MPT is the abbreviation, except there are a few. For example, carbon ha has uh, different forms of carbon, like diamond, which is an extremely high melting point because it's bonded together so strongly. But it takes something like oxygen or hydrogen, low melting point because at room temperature it's a gas. Okay, hope you've got that. Now, non-metals tend to be brittle. They're not very strong. Again, there are exceptions, and they're usually not magnetic. They certainly have different colors, 
They aren't shiny and metallic, so they have different colors. Some of them are colorless, different colors. But for example, like sulfur, which we showed earlier, the yellow powder uh, is sulfur, and you've seen that example. Uh, it's a non-metal. Doesn't conduct electricity, not a good thermal conductor, has a relatively low melting point, and it is a non-metal. Brightly colored, non-magnetic stuff. Now, what about this group that I haven't paid too much t attention to, which is known as the metalloids? So, on the periodic table, you have the metals on the left, and you have the non-metals on the right. And between them, you have the in-between guys. These are known as metalloids. And they are generally also known as semiconductors. They are very important. The examples are silicon, gallium, and something called germanium. These are all elements that, under different conditions, will conduct electricity or they will not conduct electricity. Normally, we will find that metals conduct at low temperatures and struggle. Their resistance increases at high temperatures. They don't conduct so well. Semi-metals, or metalloids, do the opposite. Low temperature, don't conduct. High temperature, they're fine to conduct. And they're very important in the electronics industry. So don't forget about the semiconductors or the metalloids. They have important properties too. Now, as we've mentioned, uh, what do we mean by an electrical conductor? An electrical conductor is a substance that allows electric current to pass through it. I want to just illustrate that idea by testing two substances, two or three substances. So uh, here I've got a circuit board, and if we can just go to it, and what I'm going to show you is I've connected uh, this to a power supply, and if I connect that end, I hope you can see that the light bulb comes on. So it indicates that the current is passing through the circuit. Now if I take a metal, uh, I've just used a common old piece of washer um, that's a metal, and I tap it in there, it's a little washer, I hope you can see that that is indicating that this metal is conducting electricity. Whereas if I take something that is a, not a good conductor of electricity, I can test it. Take this piece of wood, which is a th uh, an electrical uh, insulator. You can see the light bulb doesn't go on at all. Doesn't matter what I do to the current or the potential difference, um, there's no current passing through. I, I can change the power pack, increase the, the output of energy, electrical energy, nothing will happen. So there's an illustration of the difference between something that is a good conductor of electricity and something that is an insulator. So let's just make sure that you've got that definition. An insulator is a non-conducting material that does not allow any charge to pass through. Ex other examples other than wood could include things like paper, um, some of the non-metals, air is a non-conductor, um, something like um, if we take a look at plastic, and you could test them just like I've done, glass, etc. These are n insulators, they do not conduct electricity. Now what about semiconductors? As I've mentioned, they are insulators, laters at low temperature, but they are conductors at high temperature. And this makes them quite unique in their arrangement, and there are all sorts of special properties that they have because of that. Now, like we've spoken about uh, electrical conductors, it's important that you understand that there are thermal conductors and thermal insulators. This is just a measure of how much there is a change in temperature uh, between the barrier or across from one point to another point. So what we could do is we could have a substance over here and we could have another substance over here. We could link those two together. And so, for example, this might be um, ice, 
and we'd be able to measure the temperature of this substance here. Has it cooled down at all? Is there a change in temperature? If it's a, a good conductor of, uh, of, of heat, or if we could he have even here hot water, what happens to it? If it's not ice anymore, but hot water, what happens to it? Or even if we heat it, we put something that's hot here, does it allow wax to melt? You used to get this experimental set where you put little wax drops on different substances, heat the one end, and see if the wax melts. Those are tests whether something is a good thermal conductor or insulator. You can also measure change in temperature. Um, right, now what about magnetism? I showed you a magnet, a magnet earlier, and I showed you how that it will attract certain metallic objects. But don't be fooled, not all metals are magnets. Uh, so I want to just show that to you. Here's some aluminium foil. Like you've seen that this magnet here can easily attract and pick up. It picks up. Let's see what happens to the aluminium foil. Even if I tear off a little piece, so that you might say I'm cheating, let's pick up a little piece. No conduction. The reason, aluminium is not magnetic. Okay, this is a magnet, this isn't. Um, take copper, again, uh, no conduction. There's no uh, magnetic pull on copper, because copper is not a magnetic material. So be careful when you think of metals. There are those that are magnetic and there are those that aren't. So what do we mean by magnetism? Magnetism is a force that certain kinds of objects, which are called magnetic objects, can exert on others that without physically touching. And so a magnetic object is surrounded by a magnetic field that gets weaker the further one moves away. And so this is an important property of certain metals. The ones that are magnetic, iron is, nickel is also, and those are the two main ones. There are some others that aren't, uh, and we can get composites of those as well. But the ones that we generally use are, are, are iron and nickel uh, as being the magnetic ones. Um, there's a lot of research going into magnetism because it's a really important area. Right, now here's a, a little question that I've put together uh, for us to think about the usefulness of different substances and what properties make these materials useful. Let's have a look at it. So we have different materials and we have to state what property what properties make the material for carrying out the function. Now, tar on the roads. What does tar need? Well, the roads need to be strong. They need to be able to uh, resist heat. They, you don't want them melting. Resist, resist, resistant to heat. So you can't have them melting in, in hot sun. And that's what, what, what's really good for them. Again, burglar bars, they need to be strong, but they need to be you need to be able to shape them, so they need to be malleable. What about plastic furniture? Also, it needs to take, needs to be strong. You don't want to be sitting down on a chair and falls apart. Uh, it needs to take a particular shape. So, metal jewelry, well, it has a particular shape. Again, it must be quite durable, not reactive mustn't be able to dissolve in water. Uh, you don't want that going down the drain. Um, and you certainly want it to be shiny. Clay for building. Well, clay for building, bricks, again, I think you can agree. They must be strong. They must have a certain shape. They must be insulators. Thermal insulators, why would that be? Well, you don't want your house to just get so hot that it heats up like an oven. Bricks need to have a certain ability to insulate. Cotton clothing, again, it needs to have certain color, I would think. Uh, you must be able to take color and dye it. It must also have a certain strength. It must be strong. It must be lightweight. Lightweight. When we talk about that, we actually mean low density. So that it can be comfortable. It must be soft, so it's not tough and rub against your skin. It can't leave you with a rash. 
Uh, all of these are properties of the material, and I hope you can see that the materials are designed to do a particular function. Now, having discussed matter in, in all these different ways, there's one last thing that we really need to focus on. We've mentioned it already, but that matter in all its different forms exists in three different states. We say that la la matter exists as a solid, a liquid, or as a gas. Now, as a solid, it will have a fixed volume, a fixed shape, and so the volume is, is defined. If you take a look at this solid piece of magnet, you can measure its dimensions. It's not changing with time. <coughs> if you take a look at the liquid, the shape depends on the container. But it has a fixed volume. It's not changing. So if, for example, I were to take uh, a glass of water, um, you would recognize the shape is the shape of the water. If I put it into a different uh, a container, like a different beaker, then you would recognize the shape would change, but the volume would remain the same. The amount of stuff would remain the same. might look different in a different container. So there we go. Uh, but what about a gas? If we have a gas in a closed container, then what we need to recognize about a gas is that the gas doesn't have a fixed volume. It takes the shape and volume of the container. So it depends on what you put the gas into. If you let it go in the room, it will fill the room. How do we know this? Well, if you take a little bit of aerosol, deodorant, or perfume, you spray it. It gets into the, into the atmosphere, and very soon it fills the whole room. It takes the shape of the container in which it is. So that's an important pro property, a way of distinguishing what is a solid, what is a liquid, and what is a gas. Now, what you need to recognize, there's a transition between solid, liquid, and gases. And that's important for us to know. You've done this before, and I just want to mention, uh, as we have already, that when we go from a solid to a liquid, there is a change. And that we process we call melting. Now, that melting point is a specific temperature at which the solid changes its state to become a liquid. The process is called melting. Now, what about the next change? Freezing is the opposite process, where a liquid changes to become a solid. So if we have a liquid over here, and we have a solid over there, then that process is called freezing. Now, the interesting thing about that is that the temperature at which that happens is also is equal to the melting point, MPT. The process of melting and freezing happen at the same temperature. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I hope you enjoy that interesting fact. Now, what about boiling? Well, boiling uh, is the, the temperature at standard pressure where we get a change from a liquid to a gas. Now, liquid to gas happens at all temperatures. When it happens to all temperatures, it's called evaporation. Uh, but at a particular temperature, uh, the, there is all the liquid. All the liquid will change to gas. The liquid can't exist anymore as a liquid. It has to go to gas. That's called the boiling point. But you'll notice something here. I've said this is at a particular temperature and pressure. Because gases are funny things. They're determined by pressure as well. In fact, if you were very high up, like on Mount Everest, you could get water to boil at a very low temperature. If you're here uh, on the high felt in Johannesburg area, uh, water boils at about 96. But at sea level, it boils at 100 degrees Celsius. So there is a change in the boiling point depending on the altitude. And you need to be aware of it. 
process of changing from liquid to, to gas generally is evaporation at any temperature, but when all the liquid changes, that's known as boiling. So please take note of that. Now, how do we explain what's happening uh, in this change? And the way to explain it, we see it, we see the block of ice melting, but what we've got to do is go down and look at a sub-microscopic level. And I want to just show you very quickly what happens when we do these changes. So here's a little animation of water and this is solid water. Now what you'll notice is the molecules are vibrating all the time and they've formed up into a particular structure that has spread out. Uh, the individual molecules, there are forces between them and uh, I hope you can see those forces are holding them in a particular shape. So I I'm going to allow it to play again and uh, hopefully we can get that, that moving. If we just there we go we've got the particles moving the kinetic theory says matter is always moving whether it's solid liquid or gas in this case we've got water and it's in its solid state it's formed these ring like structures and what I want you to see is that if we start to heat it it will change uh, and there we go see the particles are moving faster, the rings are breaking, and notice now they're closer packed together. The substance is now more in a liquid state, um, and, and you can see that there's a, a closer packing together. If we increase the temperature even more, the spaces between the particles get further and further apart, and we can see some of them drifting off and they're starting to take the shape of the container. So we reckon that they've more or less got into a gas state and the temperature has got really high. Just to summarize, let's have a quick look at what happens in those three different states, solid, liquid and gas. There we go, there's the solid. Notice it's taking up bigger volume. That's one of the properties of water. It spreads out and takes up a bigger volume. What about the liquid? There you go. It's in a liquid phase. It's got closer together, less volume, and it's sticking together. Still forces of attraction. There it's in the gas phase, and it's moving our part, taking the, the whole container. Right, now let's move back. I hope you can see that this model helps us get a clear picture of what's happening when things go from solid to liquid to gas. But there's an experiment that you're going to need to do, and that's to investigate what temperature water changes from solid to liquid to gas. And I want to take you to a quick uh, diagram to show that for you. And, and here's the experiment. We're going to zoom in on it. Uh, and look at it at different temperatures. Uh, notice here is the different temperature that's been, been added. This is the time that's been taken. Notice at a low temperature, way down at 40 degrees, tight packing. Over here, the graph increases as we heat it. The graph increases. Um, and I'll just draw it on here. Uh, the graph has increased and it increases steadily until it gets to this region here which is around about zero degrees it stays flat because what's happening here is the energy is being transferred to break the solid apart here we've got some solid and some liquid but for here we've got just liquid and the temperature increases when we get to this phase here, we've got gas and liquid together. And so the graph becomes flat again, and then only when all the substance changes to gas does the temperature rise again, if we are able to trap it in a container. This is known as the heating curve. Of course you could do it in reverse, which would be the cooling curve of water. Be very clear what's happening at zero, and at the bo that, which is the melting point, and at the boiling point, dependent on your altitude, but at sea level it will be 100 degrees, that temperature will remain fixed because all the energy 
is not going into uh, giving the gas molecules more energy, but it's going into changing the liquid, all of the liquid molecules into the gas state. In the same way, at zero degrees, it's allowing all of the, the solid to become liquid before the temperature carries on increasing. Right, now, we're almost through. We've got one more question to have a look at. Have a look at this one. It deals with melting point and boiling point. It says refer to the table below, which gives the melting points of a number of elements, and then answer the question. So we've got melting point of copper, boiling point of copper, magnesium, oxygen, and carbon, helium. So what does it say? It says what state of matter solid, liquid, and gas, will each of these elements be in at room temperature? That's an excellent question. Let's go and have a look at it. Now, notice that the melting point of this stuff, copper, is 1,083 degrees Celsius. So at room temperature, which is about 25 degrees Celsius, what do you think it's going to be? It's going to be below the melting point. Below the melting point means that this must be a solid. So at 25 degrees, we predict that this will be a solid. Right, what about magnesium? Uh, it melts at, uh, at 650 degrees. So at 25 degrees, yes, we agree, it's a solid. But now look at this one. Oxygen, it melts at minus 218,4, and it boils that mean at minus 183. That means at a temperature above the boiling point, it is a gas. So at, te at, at room temperature, it's a gas. We expect that. What about carbon? Well, that's, see how high the melting point is? At 25 degrees below the melting point, it must be a solid. And what about helium? Also, very low melting point, very low boiling point. 25 degrees is above the boiling point. If it's above the boiling point, then it must be a gas. Now, here is another one. Sulfur. At 25 degrees, what we'd recognize, it's less than 112 degrees. So it must be a solid. Now, if we had something that the range of temperature, melting point and boiling point, fell between 25 degrees. Well, then we would say at room temperature, it's a liquid, like water. Melting point zero, boiling point 100. What's it at 25? It's a liquid, of course. I'm sure you've got that. Right, let's see if we can do one more question. Again, it refers to that. Which of these elements has the strongest forces between the atoms? Now, the way to do that is to look at the strength of the melting point and boiling point. The higher the melting point, the stronger they're bonded. The higher the boiling point, stronger they're bonded. So I reckon it's carbon. And that's not, not strange because we know that diamond is one of the toughest substances known to man. So my answer would be diamond because it takes more energy to break those bonds. Uh, it's held together by very strong forces. Which of these has the weakest forces? So the weakest forces will have the lowest melting point and the lowest boiling point. Which one has the lowest? Well, there's some competition here, but it's between oxygen, which is a gas at room temperature, and helium. Well, we know helium is a very small molecule. It's one of the, the smallest elements on the periodic table, lightest uh, particles, um, which we'll have more to say about in our next session. Melting point of minus Seven, uh, minus 272, boiling point minus 268. Not much difference between them. These are definitely the weakest forces. The reason is it's such a small molecule. Okay, now I have really enjoyed being with you. And I hope that you've got a big picture of matter. We've done a lot in this session. We've looked at classifying. We've looked at properties. We've looked at writing names and formula. And we've looked at the different states of matter. Please make sure that you practice lots of, of chemistry. And until next time, goodbye. Oh, my God.